Welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Impact of AI, sponsored by AI Time Journal and supported by WILDA, Women Leaders in Data and Artificial Intelligence. Each week, we explore how AI and cognitive technologies impact us daily, both professionally and personally. For those of you who I've not met yet, my name is Melissa Drew, and I will be your host for this week's podcast. This week, we are lucky, lucky, lucky to have Cindy Hausen. She is the Chief Data Strategy Officer at ThoughtSpot, where she advises top clients on data and analytic strategy. Cindy was previously the vice president at Gardner Research, where she has led the development of the data and analytics maturity model and the BI Magic Quadrant, which a lot of us are very familiar with. Recently, she was rated top 12 influencer in big data and analytics, and she's also a published author and has the host of her own podcast, the Data Chief Podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Melissa. I'm lucky, 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 lucky to talk lucky. with you. <laughs> this is going to be so great. I I checked out your LinkedIn, so not a stalker, but I checked it out, and I recognize in in you know through these interviews, I naturally start to see that nobody's journey is a direct path. Nobody oh, no. ever gets to where they started out from to where they are today in that direct straight line, and more specifically, when looking at you. You started your career with a degree in English, if, if I got that right. Yes, uh, with a major in journalism. And then you went on to get a postgraduate degree in management information systems with marketing. Yes. So yep. there's definitely got to be a story about your journey. There is. And no, looking at people on LinkedIn, that's not being a stalker. That's <laughs> how we get to know each other and and how we network in this digital world. So um, yeah, my, my, well, if I go back even before college, mm -hmm. I always loved math. I loved calculus. Well, maybe not calculus. I loved algebra <laughs> geometry and, and word problems. But one of my high school guidance counselor said to me, well, if you don't like the science, I don't really know what you're going to do. And I loved English. So um, I was going to be the great American writer. I was going to write a wonderful novel rather than all these business and technology books, but I was a lousy typist. So the, the network at University of Maryland, so picture this is the 1980s, were booting computers with floppy disks back then, and it kept crashing. And I'm like, well, I can't possibly rewrite a 25 page paper or story. Where does this go when it crashes? Mm -hmm. And that kind of sparked my interest in how technology works, how things work. Mm -hmm. And from there, you then started, I believe, early in your career working in analytics. I, I did. I, I had a, a job in the U.S. first, um, really working with DBase 3, doing project tracking. Mm -hmm. And then at Dow Chemical in Switzerland, I would write, um, I was the Lotus 123 macro queen, and then doing <laughs> reporting on the mainframe in those days. So writing programs in focus and then the business people were just so surprised I could even get to the data because usually IT was saying you can't, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would f find a way. And that, that kind of sparked the beginning of a long career, but not, you know, not linear as mm -hmm. you pointed out. So when I went back to business school, so Rice University, at that point in time, I was thinking of leaving the BI and analytics space and looking at doing maybe marketing, um, but but found if I could combine my technology with my business understanding, that really is the sweet spot of data and analytics. And so came out of Rice with a renewed um, emphasis and focus on this industry. So then if we shift forward to today, where you're working as the chief data strategy officer for ThoughtSpot, how is all that that you've developed over the years accumulated into what you do today? Yeah, so there is a lot about it that does require the communication skills. And isn't it fascinating how data storytelling is an important skill for anyone working in analytics? But 
I also think as we look at this massive transformation that all businesses are going through and that the data and analytics industry specifically is going through, you have to communicate the why and you have to inspire people. You have to manage the power in politics. And this requires communication. Technology is complex. Breaking it down into the level that you need to care about it and then communicating that back to the business is really important. So part of my role at ThoughtSpot is being a thought leader. It's also being a coach to our top customers, our top CDOs. I also work with our product team on how we need to evolve our capabilities so that we are out innovating competitors, but we really have a co-innovation model with our customers. Let me give you a scenario and, and, and then you can give me your thoughts. So I'm a, a newly appointed CDO. I've built up the business case. I've got everybody on board. So we've got the buy-in. We're starting to, to build the infrastructure. And then I'm kind of at that point with, okay, what now? What's next? Well, a couple things I mm -hmm. would ask you. So you're a newly appointed CDO. Mm -hmm. You've gotten the buy-in. And I would ask you from whom? Is oh. it from the business? Is it from the data team? And is it from IT? Because you really need all three of these working together. Now, and I would also say, if you're new, know who's going to be on your side <laughs> and who's going to block you. Do you have, as Jim Collins would say, do you have the right people on your bus to move forward? Getting that lay of the land is really important. Now, you said you have the business case, so I'm going to trust that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you, is it a big enough win? Is it a quick enough win? Because some CDOs will try to boil the ocean. There's so much to do. Um, I just got off the phone with a customer and they're like, oh, our cloud migration is going to take three to five years. And I said, okay, what will the first cut look like? Because you better be delivering something within 90 days. Mm -hmm. So, so parsing it into quick wins is important. Well, you, you just brought up something really interesting because you said that there needs to be some value within 90 days. Yeah. And, and, you know, my, my background is procurement supply chain, looking at it, you know, the data and analytics from that perspective. And there was always this, you know, what does the chief procurement officer need to do in the first 100 days? So do you have something very similar that, that you think of when you've got a, you know, a, an organization, what's the first 100 days supposed to look like? I do because again, they have to signal that there's change. CDOs, we know from research from Randy Bean, mm -hmm. New Van CEO at Van New Vantage Partners and author of Fail Fast, Learn Faster, that the average tenure for a CDO is two and a half years. So these change agents come in and if they're good, they're signaling that we need to innovate we need to focus on the business outcome. So that business case, that first business case, mm -hmm. I hope it is business outcome driven and not technology modernization for technology sake and showing measurable progress. A cloud migration is not measurable progress. You have to have better analytics and insight to action, whether it's a machine learning use case or general purpose analytics use case, I, I'm not bothered what you start with, but it has to be focused on some kind of business outcome. You mentioned supply chain. Mm -hmm. What a fascinating time for supply chain. It's, it's a great use case. Um, you know, Where do you shift your manufacturing from? Where do you source new products from as particular factories are shut down because of pandemic related or shipping related um, problems? Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on with supply chain. A lot of uh, AI technology sitting on top of the data, uh, predictive forecasting. Um, we've had you know, other conversations around visualization of the, the production lines to try to remove the errors and, and reduce the processes. But, but your focus is on the data and analytics piece. So everything that you do is sitting below that layer of the, of the AI technology, correct? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. 
And even, I mean, well, below the AI technology, I, I would differentiate there's the machine learning models. Mm -hmm. And then also part of the engine of ThoughtSpot, we do search and AI driven analytics on top of your cloud data platform. So there are AI driven insights, like it might tell you what is, um, you know, there's an unusual spike in a particular product in this particular region. Why? How, I'm curious, you're in your organization, how many data scientists do you have? <laughs> well, so within ThoughtSpot specifically, I mean, we, we have, I would call them more data analysts or mm -hmm. We like to empower the non-analysts. So the data scientists creating these models, we don't actually have any. We have engineers I love and that. people, people who are very good with algorithms. I mean, I would say our now he'll be embarrassed that I say this, but <laughs> our co our co-founder, Amit Prakash. Right. Um, is one of the most brilliant minds in machine learning and worked on Google AdWords. So he, I mean, would you call him a data scientist or yeah. an engineer yeah. or an entrepreneur? It's all of the above, but we don't have data scientists actually working on generating insights for our salespeople, our support people. We do all of that. We drink our own champagne. Um, and use ThoughtSpot for that. In our customer base, there will be, well, what's the role of the data scientists and what's the role of the data analysts and what's the role of the non-analysts when you think about no code or low code AI? Mm -hmm. I love that. I love, I love the sh drinking my own champagne. I love that reference because <laughs> who cares about Kool-Aid anymore? But no, I, I like the piece about the the, because I was writing models in 2004, you know, for, for an analytics um, application, data scientists wasn't, wasn't, you know, there, the term wasn't there. We were just all sitting around writing. Some of us were mathematicians, not I. Some of us were engineering. Some of us were in business, but we were all sitting there writing models. Um, and I think, I think we've gotten coined with that phrase of the data scientist, but, but your comment, I think, is, is a really good observation we're still doing the work. We don't have to call everybody a data scientist just because that's the, the term that's, that's being coined today. Yeah, and yeah. I think a lot of data scientists, how much are they really working on models and, and let's also operationalize them. We need more of them um, actually getting deployed in production, but they're actually working on cleaning the data finding the data, mashing the data together. And this is where we get more into, is, is this the new role of the data engineer? And mm -hmm. can we make them smarter with augmented data engineering? I think we can, um, but it's, it's still a nascent industry, yeah. but more important than ever before. If I look at the team and the team that you've developed, and then also look at some of the other companies that I've, I've talked with, I'm still finding this not a very quite balanced scorecard yet on women in technology. It's I would be not. interested in understanding your thought. <laughs> there you go, Melissa, that was it. They're not there. <laughs> so oh, even, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, really, it's really tough. So you and I have been in this industry for a long time. And actually, I think what, What's a little bit sad, um, if I think about in the 80s when computer science was first starting, there was there were more women studying that in the 80s and early uh, 1990s than today. Hmm. And there's an interesting interview, uh, a podcast, the BBC Why Factor, Where Did All the Women Go? And they think it was actually a mistake in advertising Oh, no. about how it was the Atari, you know, um, toys for boys marketing. And even if you think of the movie hidden, was it hidden figures? Yes. Right. So these, you know, the, it was the women who were doing all the math and learning how to code or, you know, um, program the IBM mainframe in, in, uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. 
so I think what we have is a combination of skills coming together, technical, mathematical, and then the business domain, whichever business domain you have. So I actually see more diversity in the CDO role, but yes. if you look beyond that, maybe in the data scientist or data analyst role, and for sure in Silicon Valley tech companies, it's super, super hard. And, and we say we have a leaky pipeline. We might be able to get women into this field, but keeping them in this field is hard. And the, the pandemic actually has made it worse. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I don't know, are we making progress or how far have we been set back in the last year? No, I, I've noticed the exact same thing with the, the women in CDOs. In fact, I've, I've made a couple observations out loud to a few folks, like how, how is it that we've always had challenges in the procurement supply chain and technology roles, but suddenly I'm seeing more women as chief analytics officer, as chief data officers. I mean, that's a very interesting observation that I'm not well, sure how it's, it's this. Yeah. yeah, I think it's because this role so uniquely requires a diversity of skills. So somebody might have come up through the business or a functional area. A lot of chief analytics officers might come up through finance or through operations um, and supply chain. Mm -hmm. And they're asking all the questions. And then I, IT or somebody will say, well, you keep asking all the questions. Why don't you figure it out? You, you can do this better. You do it. And they acquire <laughs> just enough of the technology and data skills to lead this position. The other path where I think it is more male dominant is mm -hmm. they've come up through IT and have acquired the data and business domain skills. The other thing I do think, you know, what this role is also unique in that you, you can't have an ego because you have to be so collaborative. So really people that I think are good communicators and more collaborative will gravitate towards this mm -hmm. job. But I think for men and women alike, it can also be, a, I say it's the best job and the worst job as well. <laughs> I always found that this role was the perfect union between both halves of my brain. So yes, I'm, yes. I'm able to, to use the analytical part of my brain because it's, it's data-driven, is very analytical and very detailed. But then I also get to use the creative side of my brain because I'm looking at the analytics and, and trying to visualize how, going back to your storytelling. So I always yes. find that this, this was great. This was one of the few jobs that used every part of what I was interested in. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's so true, Melissa. And it's funny, even <laughs> yesterday, I think I was doing a lot of customer coaching calls, which which can be, um, they're so fun. I feel so blessed to work with some of just the brightest CDOs and data and analytic leaders in the industry. Um, but but it's it requires creativity and problem solving. And sometimes it can be emotionally draining because you're trying to figure out what people's agendas are mm -hmm. and why, why is IT blocking when uh, this data doesn't do any good until you've unleashed, unleashed it for analytics. So what are people afraid of here? And so you're getting into the psychological, the emotional, and I'm always just trying to think, how do I communicate? And then you might do like, I just did a, a keynote in Big Data London, and I'm ac actually an introvert. So I'm trying to get over my shyness. <laughs> <laughs> and yesterday I just said, oh, thank goodness. I have time with the, the product team. I can um, use a different, a different side of my brain with that, which also requires creativity, but it, it's just um, a different emotional level. Yeah. Says the person who has her own podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then I say that's where the guests are the star of the show and mm. the stories that they so willingly share. I'm sure you feel this too, as a host of your podcast, mm -hmm. that um, it, it's a privilege really. I enjoy it. I enjoy meeting all the different people and, and their journeys and their stories. And yes, yes. I'm a, I like stories. <laughs> 
early in, in their conversation, we talked a little bit about kind of the first 100 days and pulling it together and, and what does that look like? And I recently listened to, I'm going to tie this together for you. I recently listened to a, a, a podcast on NPR, and it was talking about how our library coding system is biased. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. So I had, I like was really into this and to come to find out, you know, after about 20 minutes, uh, for example, um, our former president, Barack Obama, when they went, when he wrote his book, it was classified in the 300s, which is just a general catch-all. And it wasn't actually classified in history as a part of him being a president. And so they started diving deeper into trying to understand why. And, and there was a university that, that was sponsoring this kind of, let's redo our coding system in the Congress of Library, which by the way, got declined. But it sparked this huge thought and conversation around, well, if, if we have all this history that's built into this bias, and I'm gonna call it bias, but just bias, not to the extent that that it's truly biased, but biased to the extent of that's the data that we had collected up until now when we're making decisions around the historical aspects of the data we've collected. So pulling this all together, I would be interested in understanding as I'm building this organization, how do I ensure that I'm doing the right thing? How do I ensure that I'm being responsible, that I'm you know, making um, my models so that my models aren't you know, tied to the, the wrong connectivity with the, the data that I've collected or lack of collecting. Yeah. So I'm glad you care about this. It's a, a important topic for our industry mm -hmm. and we have to keep talking about this and making sure people understand a couple things. First off, all data is biased. That, that is a given. All data is biased and, and I'll elaborate. But then recognizing the limitations of the data and how when you apply AI or machine learning on top of it, now we actually can have bias at scale, even though it's not intentional. And this is why I think diversity in tech and data and analytics is so absolutely critical because then you may not even recognize the, the bias data gaps and the bias output of your models. So I think diverse teams can help offset this a little bit. And if you can't have the diverse teams, it's actually having a kind of review board or um, a, a stakeholder who, who might be negatively impacted. You have to make this part of whenever you use something or operationalize it. So that's the first part, but let me come back to why I say all data is yeah. biased. Oh, that's, yes, please. Yeah. Think about anything you're looking at. Um, so, social media, um, use, use that as a particular data set. Well, is everyone on social media? Not in certain in countries where maybe they can't even afford phones certain age groups are not using social media. So that is biased towards particular um, income levels as well as age. If I think about um, the CDO at MasterCard was recently talking about this. If you go back too far in time for financial services, when could women have their own credit cards um, or as I lived in Switzerland, you were not allowed to, if you were married, you were not allowed to have your own bank account in 1996. I'm not even sure you still can. It has to be in your husband's name. That's not that long ago. So if you're training your data on a data set that um, includes a lot of history, then it might be skewed by, by gender, for example. The, the models could be really good models. Yes. But if I'm not using a diverse set of data or at least recognizing where the gaps are so that I can articulate that, then the models are just working the way they're supposed to be working. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Even there was, <laughs> there was a fascinating um, article about on, on TikTok that I think it was lingerie ads 
um, and videos that it, it kept pushing out images of um, skinnier, more attractive people and more voluptuous body types were not pushed out. And th think about who, you know, I, I think this, I'm trying to remember in, in Asia who built mm -hmm. this particular algorithm um, but why? It had a cultural bias towards a preference of a certain body type. What are some of the things that you can recommend to help overcome that? So, so going into it and first recognizing, understanding that data sets, data sets will have gaps and then ed educate the team. I, I actually think these books should be mandatory reading for data and analytics teams, but also for anyone in university programs. So I, I would recommend these three books, Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology. And this really looks at how some of the biases are, it really goes back to society and systemic problems, but it really challenges your thinking mm -hmm. about how um, even if you look at imaging and policing and where are the cameras that capture pictures of crimes if it's more in poor neighborhoods it just perpetuates some things the other book from a gender diversity is um, invisible women and this is about gender <laughs> it's expo exposing da um, data biases gender gaps and if you read that you'll never think about snow plows and women's bathrooms the same way <laughs> And then the last one is um, <laughs> Kathy, Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math, M-A-T-H, Destruction, okay. <laughs> is, is another really good one. That's awesome. I love that. So now I got to go read it because now I got to go figure this out. Oh, you out. have to. Yeah. <laughs> you have to. Oh, okay. So as we both belong to this group, Wilda, I think yeah. we need a book club. Everyone has to read that book. <laughs> so I love that one. I love that one. So as we start to, to wrap up today, what are some of the lessons learned? You know, you've been there, you've done this. We've got a new group of, of people coming in, you know, um, next generation of CDOs, chief analytic officers, data strategy officers. What are some of the key lessons learned that, that we can get to them? Yeah, focus on the business value. That's the thing. And, and deliver visible progress always communicate the why, not so much. Some people need to know the how, which is about the technology, mm -hmm. but making sure that everyone, so your business stakeholders, IT, your team of reports, that they are focused on, on the why. And, and then the how, whether it's cloud, um, whether it's a particular technology you're, you're talking about, some people will need to know that, but communicate the why. And then I would just say, you know, don't as a as a woman in tech, and actually for anyone, your career will not be linear. I think about it as chapters mm -hmm. in my life looking back now. And what what were your goals? And maybe who whose life did you touch as you journeyed through this? Um, so, so did you always yeah. want to be a chief data strategy officer? Like we had no idea that that was even a, a thing, right? No, no, I do. So I, I used to say um, data and analytics can make the world a better place. And I wrote that in one of my books. And, and this is so 10 years ago and people mm -hmm. just flat out laughed. They, they chuckled like, oh, Cindy. Um, and at ThoughtSpot, our mission is to create a fact-driven world. And I say a fact-driven world is a better world. And I look at, I recently did an interview with the chief data and analytics officer at the Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. You look at them, they are the largest hospital in the world, really doing pioneering work around heart, heart and cancer. And, and data is at the center of this. That is, so I, no, I did not envision I would have this role, but I did have a desire always to make the world a better place. And I see um, how data and analytics 
is doing that and has the potential to do that. And it's not always just like healthcare, even look at in this pandemic, the number of workers laid off or people who couldn't pay their bills on time. Mm -hmm. The cell phone carriers, the telcos, they couldn't turn them off. They couldn't say, sorry, you're not going to have internet or a phone. This is about managing working capital. And, and the telco providers were using data to measure, to improve working capital. So it's powered by data. Yeah. <laughs> nope. That's awesome. And your, your goal of making the world a better place, that's, we'll just have to start that one data block one at person. a time. Yeah. yeah. One, one data block, one person at a time. <laughs> no, I think I just never wanted to like, I just wanted to be a a good mother to my kids and have do reward, rewarding work by day. We are going to have to come back in a year from now and see what you're doing and hear some new stories. All good. Keen okay. on that. Perfect. Yeah, All definitely. Right. Well, thank you so much again for taking time today. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm.